Hi and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us um, in the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. Um, for those of you who don't already know me, my name is Raphael Fazel. I'm the Executive Director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. Um, some of you may be attending um, these kinds of talks for the first time, so I'm just going to briefly say a few words about the format of how this, how this is going to work. Um, we will be able to listen to a presentation by our speaker that will last for about 30 to 45 minutes. And we'll then move on to a sort of freewheeling discussion where you can ask questions to our speaker. You can make comments if you like, and we can enter into a discussion. So you're all uh, warmly invited to participate in that discussion. We will end this talk at around 1.30 p.m. UK time. Um, so this is obviously not our usual time slot, but um, we're very grateful to our speaker for making the time because they operate in a very different time zone. Um, so just a word on the discussion. Again, you're all invited to come in if you like. Um, if you could use the raise hand function to do so, that would be great. You can find it under the reactions button, the little smiley face on the bottom of your Zoom app. If you can't locate that um, function or button, feel free to use the chat as well. And I will then go through the different hands, the different chat uh, comments or questions, and um, either read them out loud or allow you to um, ask your questions directly to our speaker. Um, until then, I will be muting all the microphones so we can focus on the, the talk. Okay, and again, um, thanks to our speakers' um, willingness to have their talk recorded. We will be putting the talk on our website so you can watch it later if you like or recommend it to a friend to watch who maybe didn't have to the time to attend this. Okay, very good. Now with these formalities out of the way, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, we are honored to have with us Dr. Dinesh Wadiwell, who is Senior Lecturer in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Sydney. He previously taught at the University of Western Sydney, Macquarie University and the University of Notre Dame, Australia. And he also worked in the non-government sector for uh, over 15 years. Among other roles, he was senior policy officer at the Council of Social Service of New Th uh, South Wales and executive director of the National Ethnic Disability Alliance, where he represented people from non-English speaking backgrounds with disabilities. Um, Dr. Wadiwal's research focuses on theories of violence, critical animal studies, and disability rights. And his numerous publications include The War Against Animals, uh, published in 2015 with Brill, the edited collection Animals in the Anthropocene, Critical uh, Perspectives on Non-Human Futures, published in 2015 with Sydney University Press, and then the co-authored book Foucault and Animals, which sounds really fascinating, published in 2016 with Brill. Today, he will be exploring the theme of the war against animals in more detail with us in his presentation entitled The War Against Animals, the State and Private Dominion. Dinesh, thanks so much for being with us today, especially knowing how late it is in Australia. So thanks and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Raphael. And uh, it's really lovely to be part of this conversation. It's also nice to see some familiar Zoom screens pop up there. So hello to people that I know and have met in the past. Um, I want to just start by acknowledging I'm on settler colonial land here in Sydney. I'm on the land of the Wongal people in sort of central Sydney. And I just want to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that I'm on. I acknowledge that sovereignty wasn't ceded where I am. Um, so I thought today I'd talk a little bit about that book that Raphael mentioned, The War Against Animals. Um, I'm going to try and give a little bit of a summary, but it's a, a partial summary. So what I'm planning to do is really focus in on a few questions that continue to interest me around how we conceptualise sovereignty. And from that, how do we conceptualise the relationship of animals to the state? And to be honest, it's, a, it's an ongoing piece of work and I, I, I come to it as a political theorist, but one who engages a bit in law as well. And so I'm kind of interested in the conversation about, well, what is the kind of 
theoretical relationship of animals with the state and hopefully we can dig into some of that in the talk later. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so give me a second. Hope everyone can see that. Okay, all right. Um, so as I mentioned, I want to talk a bit about this book that I published in 2015 called The War Against Animals. And I think I really want to focus today on some questions around sovereignty and the way I conceptualise sovereignty in that book and how this might be used as a way to describe the form of dominion that humans claim over animals. And then from that, I want to have a bit of a conversation about the state and where does the state fit into this story and how does what's the relationship of animals to the state and, and the law, I guess. Um, so, as I mentioned, this book was released in 2015. And when I wrote it, there were a few impulses that were guiding me when I put it together. Um, the first thing is that the book it attempts to create a political theory account, but particularly what I would call a structural account of human domination of animals. And structural in the sense that I wasn't so much interested in individual relations between individual humans and, and animals, but more interested in can we thematically understand what our primary relations with animals might look like if we're going to take a more structural institutional analysis. Guiding the project were a few impulses. And one of these was that, at least at the time I wrote the draft for the book, there was a lot of animal rights theory that was largely focused on the individual action. So typically animal rights theory had emerged from animal ethics. And I'm, I guess I'm not telling this audience anything new. Um, animal ethics discussions in the 70s and 80s. And typically these resolved into more individual forms of ethics. So what, what is the uh, morally correct way that we should relate to animals and what can you do as an individual to um, address this? Now, of course, those accounts that I refer to, like Peter Singer or Tom Regan, weren't purely individual. They actually did contain lots of institutional examples of action. However, lots of the ways that they've been mobilised have been largely around individual forms of action. So you as an individual, you can become a vegetarian or a vegan and make change in your life and address how we relate to animals. On the other side, I was more interested in the institutional question. So how do we change structures of society rather than changing individuals? With this, I felt that there was an under theorization of both the politics around how we come to know animals, but also what political change looks like. And I felt that there was something to add to the discussion about how do we politically think about strategic change? But with this, what is our theory of knowledge that informs that change? So to give you one example, and it's, it's probably familiar to many people here, Lots of animal advocacy relies on an idea that if we show people the horrors of what we do to animals, say in food systems or experimentation, that this will somehow change their opinion and change their behaviour. And that's actually a theory of knowledge and a theory of change. But of course, it's highly contestable. And many animal advocates will say, well, it works for some people, but it doesn't work for others. So I was very interested in what kinds of theories of knowledge and change do we use and how do we develop them? And how does this relate to our strategies? Um, I was particularly interested in the problem of violence. And at the time I was writing, um, we, animal ethics and political conversations around animals tended not to use the word violence. Um, I think that's changed and I, I, hopefully my work has been part of that story. But at the time when I wrote the drafts for the book, very few people used this word violence. And I found this really interesting because to be honest, and it's a, the premise of the book, most of the, way, most of the ways that we directly relate to animals, if we, think, if we look at the kind of global picture, involve forms of violence and domination. 
And I was particularly interested in why we don't use this word violence. Like why, why is it that we don't theorize this? And what scope was there to develop more sophisticated theorizations of violence and power? And certainly the book advances some of this. So it talks about individual or interpersonal forms of violence. It talks about structural violence and it talks about epistemic violence. So knowledge um, and knowledge injustice, epistemic injustice. Um, at the time I released the book, there were very few political accounts, but there was one notable political account that had just been released, and that was Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker's book, Zoopolis, which was released in 2011. Um, the War Against Animals provides a very different account, though Sue and Will's work I highly respect. I think it's fabulous. Um, but they come from a liberal political theory tradition, whereas my, my background is much more as a critical political theorist. So I have a very different uh, orientation and ask a range of different questions. One of the questions I was particularly interested in the book is, is around sovereignty. And where, say, Donaldson and Kimlicker take, I, I would say, a fairly... Um, I mean, I was going to say a standard view of political sovereignty, but that's of course not true. They take a radical view of political sovereignty because they apply it to animals. However, in some respects, they conform to the liberal political tradition in how they understand sovereignty. Whereas the war against animals produces a more critical account of sovereignty that perhaps changes the way we think about what sovereignty is, including putting on the table the idea that um, we humans claim a kind of sovereignty over animals, and this is useful to think about. On that last point, I was particularly struck reading some literature within animal studies and animal welfare, which um, pointed to this particular problem of our relationship with, with animals, human relationships with animals, and to what extent this represented a form of systematic dominion or what I will call sovereignty. Um, people may know that, you know, perhaps the most cited animal welfare scholar is John Webster, the, the UK um, animal welfare scientist. And he made this remarkable statement and he's repeated it in different parts of his work to say, quote, man has dominion over the animals, whether we like it or not. Uh, Webster uses this particular um, configuration, this particular phrase to say, to more or less put the argument that whether we like it or not, we have a kind of sovereignty over animals and our responsibility is to exercise good welfare and reduce suffering when we engage with animals. But what struck me about Webster's statement was, why is it that we have dominion over animals? Like to, what, what ex, to what extent do we challenge that? And to what extent does this assumed dominion shape our relationships with animals? As a political theorist, I became interested in, is this dominion a, a code for political sovereignty? And so political sovereignty has a particular meaning. I'm gonna talk about this in a moment, but Perhaps this is a more useful way to think about what Webster's trying to get at, that we claim sovereignty over animals, and that is part of the hierarchical anthropocentrism that shapes most of our relationships with animals. Um, so let's unpack this idea of sovereignty a little bit more. And um, I'm particularly leaning on, I guess, a kind of liberal political theory. Um, understanding, although I want to trouble that a bit. So in that kind of liberal tradition, we often think about sovereignty as aligned with sovereignty of the state. So a state claims a right of sovereignty, and with this it means, at least in the kind of, I'll, I'll use the, the phrase Westphalian political tradition, um, a people claim a right to a territory to exercise control over their own affairs, over their own, you know, to levy taxations, to control their own borders, et cetera. So this is often understood as a, a, a concept of state sovereignty. Where this sovereignty came from and what legitimates it 
usually resolves in the liberal political theory tradition into a number of stories. And largely they revolve around the idea of a social compact or social contract. So perhaps most famously, someone like Thomas Hobbes, who I'll get back to later in the talk, puts forward the view that, you know, um, if, if we lived in a, I'm just roughly paraphrasing Hobbes, but if we lived in a state of nature, we'd, we'd all be, have rights of self-government over ourselves, and this would be a site of chaos and war. And in order to provide security and stability, we surrender this right of self-governance to a sovereign authority who exercises this power on our behalf. And that, you know, Hobbes, Hobbes's account is persuasive because in a sense that represents the kind of logic of the nation state. If the nation state wields a monopoly on violence and governance power over us, and we um, agree to this through a kind of social compact because we believe this is in our own interest. So that's one story of the social contract, but of course, Others like Rousseau put forward different conceptualizations, but tending towards the same thing that under sovereignty is a sense of agreement between equal partners, if you like. These conceptions are potentially at odds with different views on sovereignty and more critical perspectives. So for example, uh, indigenous rights theorists will rightly critique Western sovereignty will make the argument that actually there was no social contract that, or compact that under, underscored um, most sovereign regimes or certainly in settler colonial contexts. So in the case of Australia, um, sovereignty was stolen from indigenous people. That's the basis of the sovereignty that is uh, claimed as legitimate by the Australian government. Now this story we'll get back to in a moment. Um, now this is where I think I would differ from some of the liberal political theory, um, animal rights theory that has emerged recently. So I'm thinking particularly about uh, folk like Robert Garner, Sue Donaldson and Will, Will Kimlicker, um, as again, all of who I immensely respect, but we have this difference of opinion about what does sovereignty mean? Um, for certainly for Donaldson and Kimlicker, writing from the traditional, from the liberal political tradition, um, there's an argument put forward that sovereignty is potentially a just institution and a reasonable institution for the organization of a social order, um, rather than potentially an inherently violent institution or one based upon inherent conflict. These conceptualizations of sovereignty in this liberal political theory tradition um, also miss, I would say, an opportunity to develop a more elastic view of sovereignty. So where you tie sovereignty to the state, to this state apparatus or the nation state, then you miss the capacity to use sovereignty to, to describe different relations. And as I do in my book, to potentially make the argument that um, the kind of dominion that we claim over animals, it represents a kind of political sovereignty if we step back from it. Okay. So where did I go to in my book, The War Against Animals, with all of this? Well, I drew from a very different tradition. And uh, one thinker that was particularly influential for me, and Raphael mentioned the book that um, I co-edited with Matthew Chalou, um, Foucault and Animals. One theorist who's particularly interesting to me is Michel Foucault. Um, Foucault it was not at all a sovereignty theorist. However, in the mid 1970s, he um, uh, gave some lectures at the College de France um, where he put forward a set of views about the foundation of sovereignty. And this, these lectures proved highly influential for the thesis that I put forward again in foot forward in the war against animals. Importantly, he provides a critical alternative model to the traditional liberal conceptions. Um, so his, his starting point is to say in these lectures is to say, well, if you look at the social contractor model of sovereignty, it's faulty. Um, if we actually look at the social order, you see that it is not founded upon agreement and equality, but instead founded on conflict and subordination. Now note that, Different theorists have 
in outside of the sort of tradition that Foucault is working in have put forward similar points of view. So Foucault is not alone in making this critical um, argument. Foucault makes an argument that actually, if we look at the basis of sovereignty, it is actually, it represents a kind of ongoing conflict or war. Here he draws on the theorist, German theorist of war, Karl von Karsowitz. And people may know that Karsowitz makes the comment that war is policy pursued by other means. I.e. war is a kind of politics that is pursued through violence. Um, Foucault inverts this and says, well, if war is politics pursued by other means, this must mean that politics is war pursued by other means. And that the, the reason I'm telling you this particular phrasing is that it gives you a hint into what Foucault is trying to do with sovereignty. He's, he's trying to make the argument that political sovereignty isn't about agreement, it is actually about deep conflict. Um, he argues that, in a sense, the social order that uh, sovereignty represents is the result of a historical context, a contest that attempts to fix particular forms of social division within the social order and organizes populations between those who are superior and those who are subordinate. Um, sovereignty describes purely the emergence of this unequal social order that is granted authorization by law and sovereignty. Um, underlying this is this view is um, a perspective that there's a kind of life and death politics that sits behind sovereignty. In a sense, his argument is if we think about the origins of sovereignty as being war or violence, then the social order is a representation of what the victors of that war wanted, like how they organize the social order. In a powerful quote, Foucault says, quote, the vanquished are at the disposal of victors. In other words, the victors can kill them. If they kill them, the problem obviously goes away. The sovereignty of the state disappears simply because the individuals who make up that state are dead. Well, what happens if the victors spare the lives of the vanquished? If they spare their lives, are granted the temporary privilege of life, they agree to work for and obey the others, to surrender their land to the victors, to pay them taxes. The will to prefer life to death, that is what found sovereignty, end quote. This history, although, you know, I, I guess highly challenging, this particular view of history, it fairly sits behind the foundation of many contemporary regimes of sovereignty. This is certainly true for settler colonial contexts like Australia. So the, the story that Foucault has told about sovereignty probably accurately describes the settler colonial state of Australia. And certainly some theorists such as the uh, indigenous scholar Aileen Morton Robinson have picked up Foucault and said, well, this actually, this particular vision of sovereignty perfectly describes um, the settler colonial state of Australia, so its foundations being this kind of war. Um, importantly for Foucault, this war doesn't stop when sovereignty is announced. Instead, the conflict is embedded within social relations and continues on behind a veil of peace. So the sovereign claims that the war is over, claims that, that we're at peace now, but brewing under social relations is a continuing war. Foucault says, and I quote, war is the motor behind institutions and order. In the smallest of its cogs, peace is waging a secret war. To put it another way, we have to interpret the war that is going on beneath peace. Peace itself is a coded war. We're therefore at war with one another. A battlefront runs through the whole of society continuously and permanently. And it is this battlefront front that puts us all on one side or the other. There's no such thing as a neutral subject. We are all inevitably someone's adversary, end quote. Now, the reason I'm reading all of this stuff to you is when I first read 
these sections of Foucault's lectures, all I could think about were animals. All I could think about was, isn't that kind of what we did to animals? Didn't we use violence and domination to make them do what we wanted them to do? To install them in a social order as um, supposedly inferior beings to us? to subject them to ongoing forms of violence, and then to call this all peace and natural and the way things should be. Isn't this one way to describe the political relations we have with animals? Um, so why did I leap on this idea of war then? And what are the problems with it? Well, firstly, I just wanna say that I wasn't the first to use this idea of the war against animals, actually, it was the animal activists and advocates that I saw around who used this. And often what I found was I'd find blog posts where animal ad advocates would throw up their hands and say, there's all this violence around and no one can see the war that's going on, on around us. So I found this really fascinating that in a sense, some of the advocates actually were saying, is this a kind of war? Some people may object um, that doesn't war require two armies facing each other as adversaries. They each have arms and they're fighting. Isn't that what a war is about? But when I looked at the history of war, I realized that war itself is a highly malleable uh, concept. And certainly the history of the 20th century has shown us that how we conduct war looks very different from two armies facing each other and, and killing each other. I mean, so to give you one example, um, lots of theorists of war have pointed out that civilians rather than armed, um, the armed military have been almost the number one target of war in the 20th century. Right? So this, this reveals that in a sense, that model of war as two, two you know, forces facing each other doesn't actually apply to 20th century warfare. If we look at some of the recent technologies of warfare, like drone warfare, again, this re removes this idea that war is about, you know, two armies contesting each other. Actually, war can happen by remote. Uh, it can happen at a distance. It can look completely unlike traditional concepts of war. I was also informed by what, um, I guess some of the theorists of war would say war is essentially about. And again, turning to Karl von Clausewitz, Clausewitz says that war is, quote, an act of violence to compel our opponent to fulfill our will. In other words, it's a corporate act of violence that establishes a relation of domination with an enemy. And that to me seemed a very useful way to describe the systematic form of violence. So, so the structural forms of violence that uh, we as a society perpetrate against animals. Um, Foucault then in the, all of this was actually very useful for, for describing this conflict, but also describing how we came to the point where we believe we have a legitimated right of violence or sovereignty over animals, a right to dominate other animals. And to also make an argument that this is in a way the foundation of social and political relationships with animals. Right? So the primary foundation is this prerogative or belief that we have a right of dominion. And this informs all of the corporate acts of violence that we can we enact against, violence, uh, against animals. I note that Foucault, as I mentioned, is not the first to use this sort of theorization of war and its relationship to sovereignty. So, Lots of radical feminist theory, lots of post-colonial theory walks along similar grounds. So to give you an example, the radical feminists in the 70s, um, and I'll talk about them, people like Catherine McKinnon in the 70s and 80s, make the argument that patriarchy represented a war against women. And in a sense, they're using, they're using a similar conceptualization that I am, that mass scale violence produces a relationship of power and domination. And the difference is that I would say this, this might represent a kind of political sovereignty. I'll also just mention that I can't find a different word to describe the sheer scale of our violence towards animals. So as a political theorist, I sought to look at 
what were what were our primary structural relations with animals? And as I mentioned, what I noticed was that pretty much uh, it's it's almost complete. Almost every human relation, direct human relationship with animals involves forms of violence and domination, which twist the the actions and desires of animals to fit our will. And from that perspective, I thought, well, I think war is actually a reasonable way to describe this structural relation. Now, when I say structural, of course, there are individual relations that aren't warlike. But if we take the global picture, if we look at the our relations with billions or potentially trillions of animals in our food systems, then this is largely about violence, about mass orchestrated um, industrially organized violence. Um, so from that perspective, maybe war is the a useful way to describe it. So what are the vortexes or what are the, the elements of this war? How could we describe um, what are the elements of this war that, that mark it out as interesting or, or, or worthy of analysis? Well, following Foucault, I'd say that in a sense, um, one of the functions of this war, this ongoing conflict, is to maintain a divide between humans and animals. So in a sense, the function of the, the materialization of the hierarchical anthropocentrism that we have is to create a conception of a superior and inferior forms of being and to maintain this divide through ongoing violence. That, that's its function. Um, and through this, we have this sort of declared natural prerogative to rule over non-human life and use violence. So we claim that we have a right to do this thing. Um, now, this is resonant, as I said, as I've mentioned in the slide with other scholars. So the eco-feminist scholar Val Plumwood talks about the narrative of human mastery that allows us to claim we have a right to destroy forests and to uh, kill animals. In a sense, I'm using a similar framework, but making the point that in a sense, war serves a function or conflict serves a function here in creating that dividing line. However, what is remarkable about this conflict is it is coded as peace. So though we, for example, as I mentioned, kill, if you include sea life, trillions of animals in our food system every year, we don't call this war. Uh, we, we literally code this as peace. We believe that this is a natural order of things. Here, I want to flag what I would describe as the epistemic dimension of this. So epistemic in the sense of our knowledge systems are such that our own anthropocentrism shapes those knowledge systems. So we believe that not only that we are superior, but we naturalize this authority in such a way that we don't even see the violence that is before us. And maybe a, a kind of quick way to describe this is, you know, I'm sure many people here would have seen this. You know, you go past the butcher shop and there'll be a cartoon image of a, a pig cutting themselves with a knife, right? For, you know, with a smile on their face, right? So I'm sure people have seen this sort of image. And to me, this describes usefully the epistemic dimension of our war against animals that our knowledge systems are such that we have created a view that even when we're committing violence against animals, it is not happening. Or worse, that animals have no resistance to this violence, that in fact, they might enjoy this violence and they certainly have no particular interest in their own lives or having relief from suffering. And that to me is the most diabolical element of this epistemic dimension of the war against animals. Finally, the um, aim of this whole structural relation is to continue to deliver the spoils of domination. That is to deliver utility, pleasure, benefit to us. That's the function of it. Um, so we continue, and this is where Foucault's thesis about uh, sovereignty as capturing an inequality that generates the spoils of victory continually to the victors is useful. In a sense, our war against animals is designed to perpetuate a continuing victory and to repeat this again and again, constantly without challenge. 
this violence is so complete, this war is so complete, and our inability to see it is so complete that it is almost without trace. I argue in the book that perhaps the only trace we find of this continual widespread violence is in the forms of resistance that animals put up. Um, so our, our, the challenge for us is to see this violence, to, to see the resistance of animals to this violence and try to narrate it. So I've given a kind of whirlwind tour of my book. Um, but I want to work, move to just one more element um, of this story, which is, as I said, where does the state sit in all of this, in this story? Um, and it, part of this is discussed in my book, but since then I've been thinking more and more about this problem, about what is this, the, the kind of structural relationship of animals to the state? So where is the state in relation to this? Um, as I said, I've developed in this book a conception of sovereignty that looks different from liberal political, political theory in that I'm, I'm arguing that sovereignty describes our declared domination or dominion exercise over animals. Um, and this is not equivalent to how we would understand state sovereignty, that is the recognized authority of a state to exercise rule over a population. This doesn't mean that the state, state sovereignty has no relationship to the sovereignty I'm describing in the book. In fact, the state clearly has a role in um, human sovereignty over animals. For example, in the legal regimes which authorize violence against animals. Right? So they're here, the state and the law clearly have a relationship to this story. But I wanna talk, dig into this more because I think there's more to say about this. At least one side of this is that it isn't just that the state um, creates legal rights to use animals. It's also the state and the law is remarkable by its absence as well from these human animal relations. So here I want to use the word exception to describe this particular relation. Um, so I would argue that the law is, has an exceptional relation with animals in that the law is marked by its absence rather than its application. So for example, in many uh, jurisdictions globally, um, food systems or what happens to animals within food systems is largely exempt from anti-cruelty laws that would otherwise criminalize some forms of violence against animals. So in many jurisdictions, as people here know, um, it's, absolutely legal to do, um, to, to perform violence against certain animals within food systems, um, where that same violence would be forbidden and prohibited and subject to criminal sanction if you practice it against your pet dog, right? So this is, most people, most jurisdictions maintain this sort of division. Here, in a sense, exception is how the law works. So a law is created that provides for anti-cruelty provisions. And then whole classes of animals are accepted from this. And certainly in, in Australia, I can point to examples within uh, domestic law here where literally um, an exception is provided for most animals that humans have con contact with right, in, in the law. Right? So, um, and that includes farm animals and animals used for experimentation. This story conforms with a different theorist view, and this is um, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Gambin, who argues that sovereignty operates through continual forms of legal exception. So Gambin ar argues that contemporary sovereignty operates by placing particular forms of life in what he describes as a zone of legal exception, and this life might be subject to extreme forms of violence without recourse to protection from law. So Gambon makes an argument that in a sense, this is the essence of modern, what he would call biopolitical sovereignty. The, the prominent example Gambon uses is the German concentration camp. So Gambon makes the argument that um, it's only in contemporary sovereignty that we have created sites of exception, like such as the German concentration camp or Abu Ghraib prison, that 
um, exist as a zone of ex legal exception, i.e. those who are caught within that zone um, have no guarantee or protection from the law. And in fact, what it means to be caught in that zone is precisely to have all your rights suspended. Um, so here the law works by exception, but rather than regulation. So rather than saying you can do this and this in this space, instead the law exempts itself from operation. Um, I would say that in a sense, this is a useful way to describe most legal relationships with most animals, i.e. most animals are placed in these zones of absolute exception. So where you could do, you, you cannot, you're prohibited from acting in certain ways towards companion animals. In most jurisdictions, um, animals used in experimentation or used in food systems are almost completely exempt from any kind of legal um, uh, protection. Um, certainly, if you look at some um, industries such as uh, food, uh, fish, so seafood, um, this is almost a limitless form of violence. So in most jurisdictions, there are no animal welfare laws or regulations that um, uh, limit um, the kinds of violence applied to, uh, to fish on the seas. And this means that there's almost limitless of violence that is applied to these animals where um, with no consistency, if we compare you know, the, the sentience and abilities and knowledge of fish compared to most land animals, most, most recent science says that they're more or less the same, there's no differentiation. So exception is one useful way to, to think about this problem of the state and its relationship to animals. But I, I wanna just say one more thing, and this relates to a concept of private dominion that I talk about in the war against animals. So in the Hobbesian story that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, um, I, the, the, the story goes, we, we all surrender our own right of self-governance, our own right to use violence, and we give these to the state. And for Hobbes, we do this because living in a state where a monopoly on government and violence is exercised is a more secure state than one that there's a free for all and everybody has a right to use violence. So for Hobbes, a social contract underpins this um, uh, centralization of government and violence yet that we see in the state. The state um, exercises in this story, a monopoly over violence and exercises violence through authorized agents such as the police and the military. And this fairly describes most nation states, right? not all, but most nation states that um, most violence is exercised through authorized delegates of the state. Um, and we would certainly, have, we would, at least in liberal political theory accounts or human rights accounts, we would traditionally associate the rule of law with something like the accountable and impartial use of this monopoly of violence uh, by authorized agents of the state. Um, and as a result, we, we would tend to, if we took this, this framework, we would tend to see that um, uh, situations that happen in certain parts of the world, such as privately operated militias um, exercising their own forms of rule based upon private interests, we'd see this as undermining the rule of law. So we wouldn't see, uh, and, and the story I'm trying to get to here is that um, ideally we want to see, at, in, according to liberal political theory, we want to see violence exercised by authorized agents of the state who exercise this monopoly on violence that the state claims. And this should be impartial, impartial and accountable. Uh, where it isn't, then there's a problem. However, when we look at animals and their relationship to the state, and particularly that story about violence, actually this doesn't conform at all to the Hobbesian model. Um, firstly, of course, animals are not part of the social contract. Secondly, the violence they experience is carried out by private individuals largely, rather than authorized delegates of the state. As such, there's no monopoly of violence carried out by authorized delegates. Instead, the right to violence is broadly distributed amongst lots of humans. Um, in food systems, this violence is carried out by private organizations and their employees. So they are de facto given this right to use violence. However, this privatization or this private dominion 
extends to other spheres, including ones that we would think of as more benign. So um, certainly companion animals have um, better lives than many animals in food systems. But owners of companion animals, as Gary Francione would remind us, are given life and death powers, including over end of life decisions, right? So in a sense, the right to use violence is broadly distributed in this model, in this relationship with animals. Um, we could maybe make the argument that um, the law does tacitly give um, authorization to use this violence um, to delegates. However, this is largely shaped by this exceptional power that I've described. So it's not that the law explicitly delegates rights to use violence. It rather um, turns a blind eye, if you like, or, do, or does not provide protection um, to, the, to those who are receiving this violence. So the, the law basically says, you can do what you want. It's not, it's not the law's business to deal with this. So what I'm heading to, and this is where I'm going to end the talk, is in a sense, the relationship of many animals to the state is one where the state authorizes a kind of private dominion. That is, um, private individuals are authorized, whether explicitly or by exception, to utilize violence against animals. Um, this is not a novel thesis. So other critical theorists have put forward different views that are similar. So I mentioned the radical feminist, but Catherine McKinnon um, certainly puts forward a view that um, the law works to authorize and implement a patriarchal authority. So authorizing um, individual men to carry out the program of patriarchy, if you like. And certainly some radical feminists like Susan Brown Miller put forward the view that Men are like the shock troops of patriarchy. Um, a different account, so um, post-colonial theorists such as Achille Mbembe will make the argument that what makes the life in the colony distinct from life in, in the metropole is the complete absence of the law and the prevalence of private forms of dominion. So private militias, continuing violence, instability, et cetera. So in a sense, Mbembe and others would say that um, there's a kind of dual relationship going on between the, um, the colonizer and the colony. The colonizer has the rule of law and rights and all that sort of stuff. But in the colony, there's absolute free for all. There's private dominion, there's private militias, there's continuing violence and insecurity. Um, in these contexts that um, the radical feminists or Mbembe are trying to describe, there's a, the law gives permission to a pre-existing form of private dominion. Um, it does formally codify certain, certain rights to dominate animals, or, but it also operates through exception or through its absence by failing to regulate and giving license to violence. So allowing individuals to carry out violence. So certainly I'd say if we look at uh, forms of violent sexism or racism, violence against women or racism, um, that in a sense is how they operate. They don't, it's not like the law authorizes men to, to perpetuate violence against women, but the law by its absence uh, gives license to this sort of violence. So in this, and I'll end with this, I guess I'm interested in, to what extent does the law, is the law complicit in widespread dominion over non-human animals? What, to what extent is the law complicit with this violence? Um, to what extent is the function of this regime to authorize, to, to explicitly authorize, but to what extent is it also the, 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 the relationship of the state and the law to animals, one of the state and the law stepping away and allowing a pre-existing hierarchical anthropomorphism, post-centrism, to materialize as violence and to continue to carry out violence for reasons of individual utility or social custom. So to allow a pre-existing set of relations to continue. Anyway, I've talked for a long time. So I think I'm gonna pause there. I'll stop my share and it'd be great to, to talk about some of these ideas. <laughs>